السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستهديه ونستنصره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله نشهد أنك رسولنا قد بلغت الرسالة وأديت الأمانة ونصحت الأمة كشف الله بك الغمة وجاهدت في الله حق جهاده حتى أتيك حتى أتاك اليقين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وأنصاره وأزواجه ومن استنى بسنته واقتفى أثره إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة كل بدعة ضلالة كل ضلالة في النار رب اشرح لي صدري أسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي O praise it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most gracious the most merciful praise him seek his help and forgiveness we bear witness there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we bear witness that Muhammad is the last and final messenger. Peace and blessing upon him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. <coughs> My dear brothers and sisters, Islam inshallah tonight is our final night with the final chapter of the story of Musa alayhi salam. We have been going through the biography of Musa alayhi salam for quite some time now and uh, it would take longer time. But due to our time restriction, we have to um, uh, fast forward to the end. Um, what an amazing story, what an amazing journey we have been through. A lot of wisdom, a lot of lesson to be implemented in our daily life from the story of Musa salam and Israelite. So that will take us to the time when Harun salam passed away. He passed away shortly before Musa alayhi <coughs> salam. While the Israelite of Ben Israel was wandering in the wilderness when he died. Then after that Musa alayhi salam, not long after that, uh, as in the hadith narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu anh in Sahih al-Bukhari, Abu Huraira narrated the angel of death was sent to Musa alayhi salam. When he came to Musa, Musa slapped him on the eye. The angel returned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and said, You have sent me to a slave who does not want to die. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Return to him and tell him to put his hand on the back of an ox, and for every hair that will come under it, he will be granted one year of life. Musa alayhi salam said, O oh Allah, what will happen after that? Allah replied, Then death. Musa alayhi salam said, Let it come now. Musa then requested Allah to let him die close to the Holy Land so that he would be at the distance of a stone throw from it. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu added, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, If I was there, I would show you his grave. Below the, below the red sand hill on the side of the road. This hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari. Musa alayhi salam, Prophet of Allah, and the one of whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke directly. The one of whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala aided with miracle. He met his death with a content soul and faithful heart that looked forward to righteousness and made hearts to meet with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who brought him the glad tidings of peace. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Moving on to the prophets come after Musa alayhi salam, which the next one after that, as we know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent many prophets to the Israelite, to Bani Israel, many. The next one in line is Prophet Ezekiel or Hizqil. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an Did you, O Muhammad, not think of those who went from their homes in thousands, fearing death? أَلَمْ تَرَ إِلَى الَّذِينَ خَرَجُوا مِنْ دِيَارِهِمْ وَهُمْ أُلُوفٌ حَذَرَ الْمَوْتِ Allah said to them, die. 
and then he restored them to life. Truly, Allah is full of bounty to mankind, but most men think not. Muhammad ibn Ishaq stated uh, of Wahab ibn Munabbah said that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took Kalah ibn, ibn Yufra after Joshua, Ezekiel or Hizqil ibn Buzi succeeded him as the prophet to the Israelite. The people had fled from Palestine for fear of the plague. So at that time it was a plague that killed a lot of people. And many people were fleeing away from it, from Palestine, to a place and settled in a place called Plato. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to them, Die you all. And they all perished. A few centuries passed, and then Hizqil passing by stopped over them, wondering. There came a voice Do you want Allah to resurrect them while you watch? He said yes. Then he was commanded to call those bones to join one to the other and to be covered with flesh. So he called them by the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the people arouse and glorify Allah in the voice of one man. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala resurrected the dead through his deen. According to Ibn Abbas, this place was called Damardan. Its people were inflicted with plague, so they, f they fled, while a group of them who remained in the village perished. The angel of death called to the survivors, those who fled, and say to them, Die you all, with the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course. So they all died. After a long time, Prophet called Hizqil passed by them and stood wondering over them. He saw the bones, he saw the dead bodies. And he was standing there wondering, what's happened here in this town? Twisting his jaws and fingers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to him, do you want me to show you how I bring them back to life? He said, yes. His idea was to marvel at the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over them. It wasn't a questioning the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he can bring them back to life or not, but he was he want to marvel over the power of Allah. He want to see the, 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 the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his own eyes. A voice said to him, Call, O your bones, Allah commands you to gather up. The bones began to fly one to the other until they become skeletons. Then Allah revealed to him to say, Call, O your bones, Allah commands you to put on flesh and blood and the clothes that you will wear before you die. And a voice said, Allah commands you to call the bodies to rise. And they rose. When they returned to life, they said, Blessed are you, O Allah, and all praises is yours. Ibn Abbas reported that the dead who were resurrected were 4,000. While Ibn Salih said they were 9,000. Now this will take us to just ponder about the hadith of the plague, especially at this uh, time of, that we hear about the coronavirus, right? So the sunnah of Rasulullah if the plague attack one city, one town, and you live in that town, you're not supposed to leave, you stay there. And if you heard there is a plague in one town, you don't visit that town. This is the sunnah of Rasulullah as as mentioned in this hadith I'm going to read to you. Regarding the plague, Abu Ubaid ibn al-Jarrah related that Umar ibn al-Khattab was on his way to Syria and had reached Sarj, a town close to Syria. The leader of the Muslim army, when the leader of the Muslim army, Abu Ubaid ibn al-Jarrah and his companions met him and told him of the plague that had broken out in Syria. Umar remembered the Prophet Sallallahu saying, if it, the plague, be in a country where you are staying, do not go out of, out of it, fleeing it. And if, if you hear it is in a country, do not enter it. Umar praised Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then went off. He didn't enter Syria. Muhammad ibn Ishaq stated that we do not know how long Hizqil, Prophet Hizqil, peace be upon him, 
stayed among the Israelites before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took his life away. Or took him away. After him, the Israelites deviated from the right way of life as they usually did. So now we know the, the trend. Every time Allah sent the Prophet to Israelite, they get back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They argue with the Prophet. Some they killed the Prophet as Allah described in the Quran. That they killed a lot of Prophets as well that Allah sent to them. Then after the Prophet Sallallahu passed away, they deviated and they turned away from the path of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, deserted Allah's covenant with them. They worshipped many idols, among them Baal, so Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala sent to them Prophet Elijah, peace be upon him. So the next one in line, Prophet Elijah, or Elisha, as Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said about him in the Quran, and remember our slaves. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all owners of strings in worshipping us, and also of religious understanding. Verily, we did chose them by granting them a good thing. The remembrance of home in the hereafter, and they used to make the people remember it. And also they used to invite the people to obey Allah and, do not, and to do good deeds for the hereafter. And they are in our sight. Verily, of the chosen and the best. And remember Ishmael, Elisha, and Dhul Kifl, all are among the best. So there's one mention of the Prophet uh, Al Yasa, Elisha, in the Quran, as in this, uh, in this uh, ayah just mentioned. Ibn Ishaq said that Elisha, or Al Yasa, was sent to the children of Israelite after Elijah, Elias. He lived among his people calling them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and abiding by the message and the laws of Elijah until he passed away. Then dissension rose among them and events took momentum. Sins increased everywhere and the tyrant increased and killed the prophets. So a little bit of the history about the family of uh, al yasa alayhi salam. According to Al-Hafiz Abu Al-Qasim ibn Asakir, Elisha or Al-Yasa was ibn Aday, ibn Shaltim, ibn Afarim, ibn Joseph, ibn Ishaq, ibn Ibrahim. So he's related directly uh, somehow to the Prophet Ibrahim It was said that he was the cousin of Elijah, Prophet Elias alayhi salam. Other sources said that he had been hiding with Elijah in a cave in mountain Qasum to escape from the king of Ba'laba. And when Elijah died, he, al Yasa, succeeded him as a prophet among his people. So this just short snippet of a prophet of Islam. There's not much to mention about in the Quran or the seer of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but there were prophets, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala described them in the Quran and mentioned them by their names in the Quran. There is a lot of Israelites or uh, Israeliyat about a lot of prophets were sent to Bani Israel, but not many of them we can rely upon. Now the next one in line is Prophet Shamil or Samuel. Ibn Jarir reported that the condition of Israelite deteriorated, become bad. They committed many sins and killed whom they wished of the prophets. And that was the trend for them. Consequently, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent them to Runius king, a tyrant, who ill-treated them and spilled their blood. This is remind us from the time of Musa alayhi salam and the Pharaoh. Right? So another, another tyrant like the Pharaoh who ill-treated them and spilled their blood and set their enemies from outside against them as well. They used to go to war, taking with them the Ark of the Covenant. They did, his, they did this so that they would be victorious by its blessing. The Ark of Covenant is it's, it's a chest where it had some of the alwah of Musa salam, some of the uh, scrolls of Musa and Harun, and were kept in that chest, and they used to take it with them to war just to bring uh, barakah or blessing or be, so they become victorious. But indeed, this wouldn't help if you didn't actually um, 
carry those teaching in your heart first, it will never help. Like a lot of us these days, you know, you carry the mushaf with you in the car, or you put it under your pillow, or next to you in bed, and covered with dust. You never used it. And you think this mushaf will bring, bring protection to you. It's good thinking, good way of thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for sending the Qur'an. But we're not supposed to treat the Qur'an that way, are we? Subhanallah, we see this a lot. People sometimes wear verses of the Qur'an around the next Ayatul Kursi, the Mus'haf, and they expect that this will bring protection to them. And this is a misconception. This is in fact could lead to shirk. This is could lead to shirk. Because if you think that this verse of the Qur'an bring protection to you, not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is shirk. You're committing shirk. And wearing it around your neck will never bring any benefit to you. Putting it under your pillow will never bring any benefit to you. You need to open it, to read it, to dust it off, to put it in front of your eyes, to read it and memorize it. Because this is our responsibility as Muslims towards the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet ﷺ in many hadith encouraged us to, to memorize and read the Quran. And he said uh, in, in many sahih hadith that those who read the Quran, every letter they read, uh, ten good deeds. And he emphasized, he said, لا أقول ألف لا ميم حرف ولكن ألف حرف ولا من حرف وميم حرف. I do not say ألف لا ميم is a letter, but ألف is a letter, لا is a letter, ميم is a letter. Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم emphasizing that, you know, every letter you read from the Quran counts. Every letter you read, ten good deeds, and sometimes Allah سبحانه وتعالى multiplies to whomever He wishes. والله يضاعف لمن يشاء. So we are encouraged. Indeed, to, to read the Qur'an, because in the Qur'an there is guidance, there is shifa, there is a blessing, there is wisdom. And to unlock that treasure of wisdom which is among our hands, not, not to be like the Israelites, the people of Israel, carrying it around with us, not even opening it and opening it and reading it. Right? This is what they did. They're just carrying the, the Ark of Covenant, al alwah But they're not reading it. They're not implementing its teachings. And how many of us, they do the same? Carrying the Qur'an all the time and doing things and acts against the Qur'an. But they didn't open the Qur'an to read what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to tell them in the Qur'an. For those brothers and sisters who struggle with read the Qur'an, there's a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa a glad tidy from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa a sahih hadith. That he mentioned in this hadith, what it means in English, that whoever read the Qur'an beautifully, smoothly, perfectly, his level will be with the level of the honorable angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a great honor from Allah. You know, when you, when you try your best to, to, to read the Qur'an, to, to learn how to read the Qur'an, which is, should be our everyone's responsibility. It's not just for those who speak Arabic, unfortunately. The language barrier cannot stand between you and the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are encouraged. To, 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 to learn the language of the Qur'an. Not to, because you like your, your cousins or your friends that who speak Arabic and you want to chat with them in their Arabic language. No, you need to learn the, Quran, the Arabic language because this is your first key to un, uh, decode, to unlock the meaning of the Qur'an. You know? Of course, you need to read the tafsir, the asbab al-nuzul. You can't just go and, and read the Arabic and you know Arabic. And then you start doing tafsir of the Qur'an. This is incorrect. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying this is just the first step to understand the Qur'an. So the Prophet said, those who read the Qur'an smoothly, perfectly, without mistakes, their level will be with the Malaika al-Karam al-Barara. But what about us, those who still struggle with the Qur'an, stumble over its verses, you know, they find it hard to read. What about them? The Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the same hadith, a glad tiding to all of us. He said, Whoever read the Qur'an and stumble over its verses, له أجران. You get double the reward. Ya Allah, what a beautiful hadith. So if I miss out on the level of Malaika al-Kiram al-Barara, I get double the reward of Nutan when I'm struggling. As soon as I get the level of reading it perfectly, which insha'Allah, يعني take, some people would take longer time, some people would take short time, Depends on you and your sincerity and your class and your intention of how to read the Quran. If you are, have a good, good intention, you can do it. Everyone can do it. 
Because Allah promised us, what Allah says in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ Indeed, verily, we have made the Quran easy to be remembered. So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to us, that the Quran is easy to be remembered, so that means it's easy for everyone, not just for Abdul Rahman and Ahmed and Muhammad, those from Saudi or Egypt or Palestine, but for every single person who bear witness there is no deity of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Muhammad is the last and final messenger for everyone. Right? Because this is the promise of Allah. And Alhamdulillah, you can go to any country in the world and you find Hamad of the Quran. Those who didn't even speak Arabic. Someone from China, someone from uh, India, someone from Bangladesh, Pakistan, Palestine, Egypt, Syria, Germany, Eng you name it. And you bring them together in one line and ask them to read one ayah, they all read it the same. One surah, they all read it without a mistake. They will all read it the same way in the same manner. Because the Quran comes with a special way of reading it. It's called Tajweed, another, another way of reading it. It's not like just reading Arabic language. You read it with a special way because it's the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's important to reflect and ponder over the Quran. Find any chance to read the Quran. And don't forget about your family members. Don't forget about your children. You need to find, for, the, for, for my brothers or parents and sisters or mothers, you need to find exciting and engaging ways full of fun to bring your children to the Quran. I know we struggle these days. The temptation around our children, the YouTube, the, the DVD players and, and the video games these days for young age. Children, wallahi, these days, يعني, I've been in gathering recently to some of my friends and the kids under the age of uh, five and under the age of ten. They're walking around like this with their phones, playing video games. They're sitting next to each, next to each other playing video games on their devices. They don't talk, they don't chat. They just got there because they're coming with their parents. Parents talking and chatting, but they're forgetting about their children. Our children is our responsibility. This is what the Prophet says in the hadith. Everyone is a shepherd, and every shepherd is responsible for his own flock. The man in his house is a shepherd, the woman in her house is a shepherd. Every single one is a shepherd and responsible. So the Prophet Sallallahu to encourage us to learn the Quran, but don't forget about our friends, our relatives. He told us in another Sahih Hadith, خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ تَعَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنَ وَعَلَّمَ The best one among you are those who learn the Quran and teach it. And it doesn't mean that you have to memorize the whole entire Quran. You can memorize one surah, Read it with tajweed perfectly, and then you can start teaching that surah. There's no harm of that. You can find your, your siblings who is younger than you, get them together at home. Say, I've learned surah today, I want you to learn it with me. We can sit together in halaqah, maybe 5-10 minutes after each salah, or 20 minutes after fajr every day, we sit together. Like, make it as a routine, make it as a, a fun gathering. Yeah, like for those uh, young brothers and sisters, young children, we can just you know, uh, use uh, positive reinforcement, you know, how can we bring them to the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how can we encourage them? It is our responsibility, not them. So when they grow older, they know, they know the Qur'an. As soon as you teach them the Qur'an, you don't have to worry after that. Teach them the Qur'an, the hadith, and the, the aqidah, you don't need to worry after that. You've done your part. Then you can facilitate after that. You don't have to or guide them after that. You don't have to be uh, over them all the time. So you, you put the, the good structure, the good foundation at young, at young age and the, later it will be fun for them. Imam al-Hassan al-Basri used to say that teaching at young age is like writing on, on a, uh, or graving on, uh, engraving on a stone. It's much easier than engraving on water. Can you do, can you do engraving on water? This is when you do it at, at old age. Like my age. So, so at all age, we get uh, you know, bombarded with, with our life, you know, family commitment, work, study, other things. You know, it's, it's, it becomes harder and harder for us to, to learn. So whenever, whenever you have the time to learn, 
use it efficiently. And it, it pleases my eyes, Wallahi, to see young, young brothers in front of me tonight. Alhamdulillah, this is a good sign for the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. See young, young brothers coming to the masjid, they want to, to, to learn, they want to study about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about the story of the Prophets. This is something beautiful. You know, regardless of the temptation outside, you know, you, you could have lots of friends who's out there doing other stuff. We call it fun stuff out there. But we choose to, not to be with them and to be here in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to, to learn about Islam. And I, I would like to narrate to you the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a glad tidings. He said, مَجْتَمَعَ قَوْمٌ فِي بَيْتٍ مِّن بُيُوتِ اللَّهِ Sahih hadith, famous hadith, which mean in English, whoever uh, a, group of, of, a group of people come together in the house of Allah, يَتْلُونَ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ they, they studying the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَتَدَارَسُونَهُ فِي مَا بَيْنَهُمْ They're pondering over the verses and the meaning and, and the seerah and the, the history and the biography of the prophets. إِلَّا وَحَفَّتْهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ The angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be surrounding them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send His mercy, tranquility and, and forgiveness upon them. And not just that, my dear brothers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also mention every single one of you names to his al-mala'i al-a'la every time you come together in that halaqa sit together to learn and study the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what a beautiful honor what a beautiful reward that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention your name to his mala'i al-a'la to his honorable angels a great a great reward wallahi like if you if just reflect on that and say who am I that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned me by name to his angels it's a great reward and every time you come together, every time you call your brothers and say, can we meet at the masjid just for five minutes to read to read few ayahs, to study at this book, to read the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It won't take much to get that reward. Even if you sit together for five minutes to read one surah, one ayah, just do it. Make it as a routine. Even if you see each other just by accident in some masjid and you just bump into each other and say, you know, assalamu alaikum, uh, just nice to see you here. I thought you were going to the other masjid. It's a good time, yeah. Make it, make it, make it a positive uh, engagement. You come together and sit together. Say, can we sit for five minutes? Just we'll read surah of the Quran, and then we can go away. It is, it is important to, to focus on the word of Allah subhanahu wa taala. If we want success in this life and in the hereafter, we have to stick to the word of Allah subhanahu wa taala and the Sunnah of His Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And we don't. And this is a great lesson from the Israelite from. The story of the prophets and how the people of Israel, Ubadu Israel, they neglected the teaching of the prophets, and they were just carrying it around without even pondering or learning what it what it means, without reading it. And this is what happened at the time of Prophet Samuel. They were carrying it around and not and not learning anything. So the children of Israel remain like sheep without a shepherd until Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send them a prophet by name Samuel. They ask him to appoint a king over them to lead in a war against their enemies, that tyrant king. According to Ibn Asakir, the Israelites believed the Ark of the Covenant to be very holy an important symbol of their history. They carried the ark even in battle and believed that because of it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would protect them from their enemies. Fools, aren't they? This belief gave them peace of mind and great, great courage and their enemies were terrified by it. The enemies also believed that it was given special power by Allah. Gradually, the Israelites started to ignore Allah's law. Evil habits became part of their lives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent upon them an enemy, the Philistines, who defeated the Israelites, captured the ark, drove them out of their country, or out of their home, and took away their children to use uh, and sell as slaves. Their power were broken. They were separated from one another and were disheartened. So Samuel came to Israelite as a messenger of Allah to bring some relief. You know, sometimes when you see someone who is closer to the deen in time of difficulties, in time of troubles, you go directly to that person. You know, you feel you know, positive about him. Maybe he could lead, maybe he could help. They asked him to help in appointing a strong leader, a king 
under whose banner they would unite and fight the Philistines. Prophet Samuel, knowing their weaknesses, told them, I fear that when, when the time comes to fight, you may refuse. He knew them. He knew the nature. And this is very important. Listen to us. When you, before, when you talk to someone, it is always important to find the keys to the heart. You need to know their background. You need to, to know how they think, how they react, in order to be effective in your da'wah. This is very important. So he knew them. He, he knew them very well. And he, he told them. He was frank with them. He was open and honest. He told them, I fear that when the time comes to fight, you may refuse. But they assured him that they had suffered enough insults and were now ready to fight in the way of Allah, even if they lost their lives. Prophet Samuel prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance. Allah revealed to him that he had chosen one, Talut. To be their king. So the Prophet ﷺ, Prophet Samuel told them who wanted to know how to recognize the future king. He was told that Talut would come to him by himself and that they should then hand over the control of the kingdom to him. For he would lead them in battle against the Philistines. Talut had some char characteristics. He was tall and sturdy, pious and very intelligent. He lived and worked with his father in, on a farm. And one day, several, several of the donkeys in that farm were lost. So Talut, with some of his servants, went to look for these donkeys. They went for days looking for the donkeys. And then he said to his servant, you know, we've been out for days, we're tired. Probably my dad is, is, is worried about, about me now. We probably, if we went, by the time we go back, maybe the donkeys will be back. Or he could find them somewhere. But then his servant suggested to him, you know, we are now in the land of Prophet Samuel. We should just go pay him a visit. You know, he's, he's a righteous man. He's a, he's a prophet. We learn from him. And this is something, you know, very nice comes from a servant. You know, he's supposed to be the servant. He advised his, you know, his uh, employer. You know, we need to go there. And this is, can tell you a lot about the characteristics of Talut himself. That he was humble. You know, if his employee told him that, you know, you shouldn't be going home. We should do this instead of that. If someone else he said, no, I'm, I'm the boss. I will do it the way I want it. We, we have to go now. You're not the boss. I'm the boss. Right? A lot of us would, would say that. But look at uh, Talut. Great deal of characteristics. You know, even, even though he was, you know, he was strong, he's courageous, he's tall, he's, he's rich, he's pious. But his piety uh, directed him to listen. You know, and this is very important. You need to humble yourself. If someone comes to you with advice, listen. Even if he's younger than you. Even if you think he's not knowledgeable or as knowledgeable than you. You know, some people, when, when they've been advised, they get, you know, angry when they've been told, you know, sometimes they're told. But this is depends on the, on, on, on the way of advising people. This is very important as well. Sometimes we advise people in a harsh way to embarrass them or to push them away. You know, advising people in public, this is unacceptable. You see your brother doing something wrong, you don't go and advise them in, in public, in front of everyone, say, he did that. And, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. You should do this instead, in front of everyone. This is not a way of da'wah. This is not uh, a kind way. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encouraged us. When we give da'wah, we have to be kind, we have to be respectful. Use wisdom when you call for the sake of Allah. When you give da'wah, you have to use wisdom. And he said, beautiful, kind, advice right so if you read the Quran if you read that verse in particular let's stop here and just explain a little bit more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says al al -hasana. Al came on its own as a, as a noun wisdom but there is no adjective Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't say beautiful wisdom or uh, kind wisdom Wisdom came on its own. But when it comes to advice, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hasana. Mawadatil Hasana. Kind 
uh, excellent, uh, beautiful, respectful advice. Right? Why wisdom didn't come with an adjective? Because it's wisdom. It's complete, it's perfect. If you have the wisdom, you don't need to have any more adjectives to it. Right? That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Bil, bil, bil hikmati wal al hasana. So wisdom, it allow you, if you have that wisdom, it allow you to choose the time, the place, um, uh, the perfect time, you know what I mean, uh, and the place to give the da'wah to this person. Okay? The way, the approach, many things involve in wisdom. Kind words, ma'udat al hasana, of course you need to be kind, you be, you know, calming tone and your voice and many things that we need to uh, excel ourselves, many tools that we need to have when we give, whenever we give da'wah to someone. Anyway, back to uh, uh, Talut. Talut being advised by his servant to stay, not to go back straight away and to just to go and visit um, uh, the Prophet uh, Samuel alayhi salam. Then he accepted, he agreed straight away. He said, yes, we go and meet him. So when they met, Talut, uh, Talut met Samuel alayhi salam. Talut um, met Samuel alayhi salam and greeted him with, with salam. Then Prophet Samuel responded and he saw in him this is the, the, the king that he was looking for. When, 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 Ta, when Talut saw Samuel, he also recognized that he was a prophet straight away. He, he, he could sense the prophethood in him from his wisdom, from his talk. So they both recognized each other. So Samuel recognized Talut as the king that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had chosen for them. He then told Talut that Allah has chosen him as the king of the children of Israel. His duty would be to take charge of their affairs, to unite them under one banner, and to protect them from their enemies. If he carried out Allah's commands, he would be giving victory. So Talut was surprised by this sudden honor offered to him. It's a big responsibility. If someone comes to you, meet you for the first time, you said, you know, you, you're going to be the king. Of course, you'll be, you'll be surprised. This is a great honor and also a great responsibility. It was also a heavy responsibility. He, pro he protested to the Prophet ﷺ that uh, he was uh, of the children of Benjamin, the least famous of the tribes of Jacob. So he said to him, you know, I'm not from big families that they can lead the tribe, the other tribes of Israelite. You know, trying to make an excuse, a humble excuse, so he will be excused from this great responsibility. He didn't have that, um, anything to do with leadership or kingship, and he had no wealth. Some, so Prophet someone told him that it was the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he should be the king. And that he should thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his favors and be strong in faith. So, Talut appointed, uh, was appointed as the king. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, about this beautiful story in the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, as he said, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ألم تر إلى الملأ من بني إسرائيل من بعد موسى إذ قالوا لنبي لهم ابعث لنا ملكا نقاتل في سبيل الله قال هل عسيتم إن كتب عليكم القتال ألا تقاتلوا قالوا وما لنا ألا نقاتل في سبيل الله وقد أخرجنا من ديارنا وأبنائنا فلما كتب عليهم القتال تولوا إلا قليلا منهم والله عليم بالظالمين الله سبحانه وتعالى give us the proverb the story of Banu Israel after Musa alayhi salam passed away they said to a prophet which is Samuel alayhi salam find a king that you can lead us against the tyrants and, and unite us and under one banner. 
So he said to them, قَالَ هَلْ عَسَيْتُمْ إِنْ كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمْ قِتَالُ أَلَّا تُقَافِلُ I'm worried or I fear that when it's time for fight, you will betray me. قَالُ وَمَا لَنَا أَلَّا نُقَاتِلَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ Why we shouldn't fight for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after what happened to us. We've been drove away out of our own homes. Our children went, went to be sold in the market as slaves. And this and that have been happened to us. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described their reaction after. فَلَمَّا كُتِبَ عَلَيْهِمُ الْقِتَالُ تَوَلَّوا When the time for the fight comes, a lot of them have betrayed Samuel alayhi salam and Talut and they ran away. إِلَّا قَلِيلًا مِنْهُمْ Only few that followed. وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ بِالظَّالِمِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all knowing with those who transgresses. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explained more about Talut. وَقَالَ لَهُمْ نَبِيُّهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ بَعْثَ لَكُمْ قَالُوتَ مَلِكًا Their prophets, their prophets of Will alayhi salam told them that Allah sent Talut as a king for them. But they didn't like it. Because he wasn't from the big, fa big families. He wasn't as rich as some of the families. قَالُوا أَنَّا يَكُونُ لَهُ الْمُلْكُ عَلَيْنَا وَنَحْنُ أَحَقُّ بِالْمُلْكِ مِنْهِ How can he be a king upon us? And we have more right in king, kingship than him. وَلَمْ يُؤْتَ سَعَةً مِنَ الْمَالِ And he didn't have much money. قَالَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ اصْطَفَاهُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَزَادَهُ بَسْتَطَانٌ فِي الْعِلْمِ وَالْجِسْمِ He said to them, Samuel alayhi salam, that Allah had chosen Talut over you and increased him in knowledge and strength. وَاللَّهُ يُؤْتِي مُلْكَهُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَاللَّهُ وَاسِعٌ عَلِيمٌ Allah gave his kingship to whomever he wishes. And Allah is wasi'an alim. وَقَالَ لَهُمْ نَبِيُّهُمْ إِنَّ آيَةَ مُلْكِهِ أَنْ يَأْتِيَكُمُ التَّابُوتُ فِيهِ سَكِينَةٌ مِّنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَبَقِيَّةٌ مِّمَّا تَرَكَ آلُ مُوسَى وَآلُ هَارُونَ تَحْمِلُهُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَةً لَكُمْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ So when Talut salam set out with the army, he said, Verily, Allah will try you by a river. فَلَمَّا فَصَلَ طَالُوتُ بِالْجُنُودِ قَالَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مُبْتَلِيكُمْ بِنَهَرٍ فَمَنْ شَرِبَ مِنْهُ فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي So at the beginning, when Talut called upon them to join, and Samuel salam called up on the Israelites to join for the army, a lot of them ran away. And in some narration that around 80,000, they just refused to join them. 80,000 refused, only, only 4,000 left. And then another test has came. When they, uh, before they, just before they beat the enemies, they pass a river. Talud told them, you cannot drink from that water. Now this is a great test, you know. You're going to fast before you meet the enemies. You, don't, you, you can't drink from that water. This is a great, a great test. Not many escaped that test. So another few thousand people out of the 4,000 left, uh, they escaped as well. They refused to, to join and they drank from the water. But the lesson comes, insha'Allah. فَلَمَّا فَصَلَ طَالُوتُ بِالْجُنُودِ قَالَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مُبْتَلِيكُمْ بِنَهَرٍ فَمَنْ شَرِبَ مِنْهُ فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي When, when Talut set out with the army, he said, Verily, Allah will try you by a river. So whoever drinks from it, he is not of me. And whoever tastes it, tastes it not, he is of me. Except him who takes, therefore, thereof, in, it, in the hollow of his hands, so just a little bit in their hands. Yet they drank a lot of it, most of them, except a few of them. So when he had crossed it, meaning the river, 
He and those who believed with him, they said, we have no power on this day against Jalut and his hosts. فَشَرِبُوا مِنْهُ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا مِنْهُمْ فَلَمَّا جَاوَزَهُ هُوَ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَعَهُ قَالُوا لَا طَاقَةَ لَنَا الْيَوْمَ بِجَالُوتَ وَجُنُودِهِ When they crossed the river, with those who did drink the water, some of them said, we have no strength to, to meet this big army. We lost a lot of people, they refused to come and join us and fight with us. We are small in number. But the lesson comes that even if you are small in number, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessing is with you as long as you follow the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Numbers mean nothing. Numbers means nothing. And this is proves it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, but those who knew with certainty that they were to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said how, how often a small group of, a group of people overcame a mighty host by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leave. وَاللَّهُ مَعَ الصَّابِرِينَ And Allah is with those who are patient. And when they advanced to meet Jalut and his forces, they invoked. So they, they follow the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so they continued. Of course, some people left already, so that, that small number of the followers of, of uh, Samuel and Talut, with patience and strong faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they stood firm against Jalut and his big forces. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described in the Quran in the next ayah, it says, وَلَمَّا بَرَزُوا لِجَالُوتَ وَجُنُودِهِ قَالُوا رَبَّنَا أَفْرِغْ عَلَيْنَا صَبْرًا وَثَبِّتْ أَقْدَامَنَا وَانْصُرْنَا وَثَبِّتْ أَقْدَامَنَا وَانْصُرْنَا عَلَى الْقَوْمِ الْكَافِرِينَ This is the time you need to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, you have a good intention now. Those people left, they have very good intention. They believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They follow the commandment of Him and the messengers. And they submit themselves to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And remember when we said that before, that you do your... You do your part, you do your part, and the outcome from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like that Sahabi who came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, asking about his camel. Shall he tie him up? Shall he tie the camel up or just leave him? And Allah will protect his camel. What the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam advised him to do? Qilha wa tawakkal. Tie your camel and then do tawakkul. Rely upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we need to do our parts. You cannot expect the victory to come to you while you're just sitting home. Can you? You need to do your part. You need to show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you're trying and then the outcome from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't need to regret anything after that. Even the outcome is not desirable to you after you've done your part. You study hard for the exam. You made your dua, you made your salah. You study, you read your books. You went for the exam. The outcome was not that good. Don't feel ashamed. Don't feel sad. Because the outcome is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants this to happen to you for, 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 a, for a good reason. Everything happened to us is for a good reason, Allah. So we have to accept the destiny and the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we need to do our, do our part. We need to try. Al-akhdu bil asbab. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explain after what happened next. فَهَزَمُوهُمْ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ فَهَزَمُوهُمْ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَقَتَلَ دَاوُودُ جَالُوتَ وَآتَاهُ اللَّهُ الْمُلْكَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ and, they, and when they advanced to meet Jalut and his forces, they invoked our Lord who forth on us patience and make us victorious over the disbelieving people. Talut said 
about organizing his army with strong faith and wisdom, he ordered that only men free from responsibilities should join. Those engaged in building homes, men who were about to be married, and those who occupied with business should not join. Because he won those who are only devoted, who has nothing to lose. After establishing a well-trained army, he decided to put them to the, re to the test. He told them that along the road, they would pass a river where they should drink enough water to quench their thirst, but not more than that. To his disappointment, he discovered the majority of them drank more water than they should have. He discharged them from disobedience, for disobedience and kept only the few who had obeyed him. And that's what you need to keep, those who listen and obey. As they were the ones who pro proved their sincerity, this resulted in a, a split in the army, but he was not bothered. He believed in quality and not numbers. Better a small band of true believers he could rely on than a huge army of unreliable men. Very smart way of dealing with them. So Talut's men sighted the enemy on the other side of the river. They, their opponent appeared physically strong and were armed with bitter weapons. They were led by the mighty warrior Jalut, known for his huge build and brute strength. A great number of Talut's men ran away on the seeing of the strong force. The small band that remained were willing to fight, whatever the outcome, for they had heard that there, there had been many incidents in the past in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused the small force to beat a larger one. One of the army, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, the one who killed the fearless enemy, Jalut was Dawood alayhi salam. Dawood alayhi salam was not prophet then, but he was one of the army, one of the faithful men who, who left, the few men who fought with Talut and Samuel alayhi salam. And he was young, righteous, pious, and he was the one who killed the Jalut. When the two armies faced each other, Jalut challenged any soldier from you know, it's, it's a habit when the two armies come together. So one from this army comes and one from this army comes and they have a first like one-on-one -on -one challenge. So uh, Jalut came out and asked for one to challenge him for a single combat. As was the custom of battle back then. Jalut also wanted to show off his strength. The men were terrorized. A lot of people, even though the good faithful ones, they were terrorized. And no one had enough courage to volunteer. The king offered the hand of his pretty daughter in marriage to the man who would fight Jalut. But even this tempting offer did not change the deadly silence among his soldiers. So he said, even one can come out, the winner he will marry my daughter. Then to everyone's surprise, a young man stepped forward. A roar of laugh echoed from the enemy's side. So they start laughing at him. And even Talut's men shook their heads. His own people shook their heads when they, when they saw David salam, Dawood salam, come out. The young man was Dawood salam, from the city of Bethlehem. His elderly father had chosen three of his sons to join Talut army. He had instructed the youngest one, David salam, not to take part in, it, in the fighting, but to help the army in other way to report. As a father, you need to this is your children. He sent three and he said to the younger one, you don't need to be at the front line. You need to just be at the back. You know, you can help out with other things, carry water, help the wounded one, do other things, but don't be on the front line. So there's other ways of helping, but don't be at that, you know, risky part. Although Talut was very impressed by, by the wood's carriage, he said, I admire your carriage. But you are no match for this mighty warrior. Let the strong men come forward. He advised him. He was worried about him as well. 
Dawood السلام, however, had already decided and was willing to meet the challenge. Proudly, he told the king that only the day before he had killed a lion which had threatened his father's sheep, and on another occasion he had killed a bear. He asked the Lord not to judge him by his appearance. So this is the time to show you, you, you know, your strength. This is the time you can talk about you know, in, in, in a show of way. This is the only time. So he talked to that king, he was laughing at him, he says, no, I killed a lion and I killed a bear, and I can do this and I can do that. Don't be, you know, uh, don't laugh at my appearances. Don't, yani, don't look at me, but just try me. Test me. Don't judge me by my appearance. Talut, salam, Talut was surprised by young, young David's carriage. He agreed. He said, my brave soldier, if you are willing, then may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide you and grant you the strength. The king dressed David in battle armor and handed him a sword. But Dawood was not used to wearing battle dress. He felt uncomfortable in it and is obstructed him or his movement. So he removed it. He removed the armor. So in another way, he became more lighter to maneuver around and move around quicker. He felt uncomfortable wearing it. Then he collected a few pebbles and filled his leather pouch with them. He slung it over his shoulder next to his sling. With his wooden staff in his hand, he began to walk towards the enemy. Talut was worried and asked him how on earth with the sling and a couple of stones was he um, going to defeat himself against the giant? Dawood replied, Allah who protected me from the claws of the bear and the fangs of the lion will certainly protect me from the, the brutal king. When Jalud set eyes on the lean young man, Dawood, who looked like a boy, he laughed loudly and roared, Are you out to play war with, with one of your playmates? You coming here to play, young man? So start making jokes about him. Are you tired of your life? I will simply cut off your head with one swipe of my sword. The wood shouted back. You may have armor, shield and sword, but I face you in the name of Allah, the Lord of the Israelites, whose laws you have mocked. Today you will see that The sword that kills, you see that the sword that killed, but the will and the power of Allah. You will see that the sword will never kill, but the will and the power of Allah will kill. So saying that, he took his sling and placed in it a pebble, like this, from his pouch. He swung and aimed it at Jalut. The pebble shot from the whirling sling with the speed of an arrow and hit Jalud's head with a great force. Blood gushed out and Jalud thumped to the ground, lifeless, before he had a chance to draw his sword when the rest of the men, when the rest of his men saw the mighty hero slain, they took to their heels. The Israelites followed in hot pursuit, taking everyone, taking revenge for, for everyone for those years that were under the brutal rule of that brutal king. Dawood became a hero overnight. Talut kept his word and married his daughter to Dawood. And with this note, because we have no more time for Isha, inshaAllah, I will say what you listen to, and I will say to you, 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 اللهم كل إخوانا مستضعفين في سوريا اللهم كل إخوانا مستضعفين في فلسطين اللهم كل إخوانا مستضعفين في كل مكان يا رب العالمين اللهم حرر أقصان الأسير اللهم لا تأذن بهدم الأقصى ونحن شهود اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا وزدنا علما وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين سبحان ربك رب العزة عما سفون وسلام والسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين جزاكم الله خيرا والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته